All right, so let's go ahead and get started here. First of all, uh, thank you all for making the time this afternoon. And for those that are joining us uh, afterwards or listening to this recording at a future point, uh, thank you for sharing uh, your time with us on this important topic. Um, today, we're gonna be speaking with uh, five panelists who are CIOs and technology leaders here in the Chicagoland area focused on best practices and readiness and response uh, from a technology standpoint for COVID-19. Uh, this event is sponsored by Sim Chicago, uh, the chapter here in the Chicagoland area. And we are joined today by the chapter president, Rick Merrick, who happens to also be one of our panelists. So with that said, let me go ahead and get started here. Um, first of all, our agenda today is going to be uh, very straightforward. Uh, I'm gonna briefly introduce our panelists then we're gonna talk about the responses that we've received and the practices and the insights that uh, have been shared. First and foremost, putting people first. How are things different in this time of crisis? What are you doing and how are you responding to it? Secondly, we're gonna talk about readiness, uh, things from connectivity and the considerations to consider about connectivity and all of its different components, um, cloud platforms for email and collaboration sake, and then back office systems and strategies looking at um, what's common and what are people doing about it to make uh, on-premise operations successful. Um, secondly, or thirdly, I should say, we're gonna look at the operations elements of this, the keeping the IT lights on, even while everyone else is, is out of the office, um, looking at the IT supply chain itself, vendors, providers, and suppliers, information security, something that uh, shouldn't be overlooked and is actually more important probably during this time of uncertainty is how safe are we being while we're remote? And then uh, the last point on this one is balancing the IT portfolio. Um, in this newer area of uncertainty, how do you make certain projects, platforms, and priorities are all still aligned? Lastly, I'm gonna ask our panelists and anyone else to share advice and guidance. So with that said, let me briefly introduce uh, our attendees uh, and panelists um, today. Firstly, we're joined by Eric Alt from LaSalle Network, which is a recruiting and search organization. Uh, Eric and the team are operating in five locations with over 250 users. Uh, we're also joined, as I mentioned a moment ago, from Rick Merrick. Uh, Rick is the CIO at TCS Education System that has over 10,000 students and faculty and staff uh, here in the Chicagoland area. Um, we're also joined by Scott Berkey with the Illinois Housing Development Authority. Uh, Scott's organization is based in the loop, uh, has over 300 users, and more importantly, provides housing finance support. Uh, for developing families and people in need. And that is something that obviously needs to continue uh, during this time of uncertainty. Fourth, we have Mark Forbes with us from DNW Fine Pack. Mark's organization's one of those actually on the front line of sorts. They are in the business of manufacturing take home packaging and, and cutlery for everybody that's going to be eating from home or eating from takeaway for the next several months. Um, his organization is serving and, and supporting that. Badri Harif with the Octave Group uh, is joining us. He's coming to us from a company with 11 global locations and over 600 users. And then myself, uh, I'm with CBiz, uh, with the Office of the CIO Services and happen to be a multi-industry CIO, uh, the largest of which institutions had over 600 locations and 40,000 users uh, in 130 countries. And I've seen some of these sort of things, uh, unfortunately, before unfold. So, Let's jump into what we've learned and what we know. Um, on readiness, uh, let's talk about the responses we got in the survey and how that has played out. Um, you know, we asked one of the key questions was, you know, what part of the economy are you coming to this survey from and are you a member of? And the overwhelming response we got was commercial business, uh, one form or another, whether it was B2B or B2C. We also had respondents uh, across the spectrum from government, government affiliated, academia, not-for-profits and others um, all responded to the survey. And I would say this is a fairly good representation of the chapter. When you look at uh, some Chicago chapter and its membership, this is a good um, representation of them. And when you think about, we have 40 some odd attendees and I think we're up to that number now attending the event right now. Um, we had 17 responses, which is a great survey response rate on such a short notice. And so for those of you that did respond or had a chance, thank you for that. Truly appreciate it. Um, and my panelists, I'm going to go back a couple more slides here, and then I'm going to come back and get your thoughts on it. Um, the workforces that, that that survey response represented included 
every everyone from a zero to 100 employee organization to over 5,000. Um, and that's also, I think, a good representation of our, our demographic uh, here in the Chicagoland area. Um, there's a lot of people that are um, operating and working remotely for the very first time. And I'll come on to that stat in a minute, but one thing that jumped off the page when I began reading the survey results was over 70% of the respondents indicated that their workforce was overwhelmingly on premise. And so they've had to make some very quick decisions and pivot very effectively in a short period of time to continue to deliver some degree of uh, business um, in one way or another um, in just the past 10 days. And there, there we go, there's the statistic. 76% uh, or more um, are working on premise today and so they're now finding some degree of accommodation for, um, in many cases, people are being asked to work from home on home computers, but in, in a balancing sort of way, and you'll see in a couple more slides, they're also working from uh, corporate issued assets that have been acquired or issued in just the past week or two to people who otherwise have been on, on PCs in the offices. Um, and I think lastly on this um, is, you know, how large of a team are you working with? Um, that's been one of the curiosity, certainly for myself, is how do you respond to something like this when you're supporting an organization of hundreds or thousands? How many humans do you have working within your organization to support and make this possible? And as I think you'll see here, that there's a, a likely tendency that there are fewer IT people than there are typically humans in these, in these businesses. And that staffing level um, certainly is putting a demand on your organization. So with that as sort of the, the background around who, who has responded and, and what are we seeing, I am gonna ask a couple of our panelists to sort of give us their first thoughts when they began thinking about a shift to a remote workforce. Um, and I'm gonna call on Scott first and then I'm gonna call on Rick. Um, Scott, from your, your organization's perspective, when did you guys first start thinking about this and what were your initial thoughts or, or, or concerns? So we are federally mandated and federally assigned as a coop organization. So we have to have a continuity of operations plan that meets federal guidelines. So we, we staffed for our coop leader inside of the IT department and took on all the business continuity planning and the technical DR uh, very early on. So we've been working through the process of taking our organization through what would it mean not just to work remote, but in situations exactly like what we're talking about for the last two years. So I think that it was, it was serendipitous and, and also a lot of good work by some very qualified people to walk our organization first through the process of what does it really mean to answer that question? Then the activities working upwards from uh, individual scenarios and individual departments, then cross department, then division, then across the entire organization. So we've been very focused on this intently as, as one of our core activities the last two years. And, and we're actually very pleased with how the organization as a whole has been able to respond in a very short amount of time um, since we received the directive to, to be remote. We, um, IT also uh, sits on the executive council and on as a voting member of the incident command team. So that's really helped us integrate the technology into the business operation piece of that conversation, which we also lead. Got it. All right, let me switch over to Rick here real quick. Um, Rick, you're in an educational uh, institutional role. Talk to us about some of your first thoughts and reactions to this, because you obviously have a different demographic. Yeah, so we have, um, we're spread out at 13 locations around the country. Most of our students and staff are located actually in California. Uh, so when this started to boil over a couple of weeks ago, um, our first thought was, you know, we might have a problem uh, in California that's going to hit us uh, a lot faster than Chicago. So we began trying to think through that. Uh, we've got about 9,000 students and um, just over uh, 1,000, maybe 1,200 employees uh, full-time and part-time. And we, we pulled out our uh, business continuity plan that we put together a few years ago we started identifying critical functions and we realized quickly that um, 
you know, most of them had desktops and what were we going to do about it? So I started to, uh, you know, put orders in quickly to our suppliers uh, to try to get uh, desktops ordered. And this is when, you know, really having relationships really, really matter uh, when you're working with, uh, you know, your vendors, when you really treat them like partners and you've got good relationships and you don't just always go for the cheapest price, but you go for the, a good quality organization. When you have to pull in favors and say, I need hundreds of laptops tomorrow, uh, I'll get you the PO. Can you just start working on it? It's really good to have those relationships in place. Yeah. And so we, we started getting those in and prepping them uh, very, very quickly in anticipation of, of everyone going remote. Um, and uh, most of our students are on ground students. They're not, most of them don't, uh, don't take online classes. Uh, and so we knew that, um, you know, eventually it was only going to be a matter of time when they would have to go uh, online. We, were, we started to see other uh, institutions in California going that way. Um, and so we were in a race to prep uh, the, all, the, the, all the staff and get them to laptops and switch them out at the same time, putting together the right training. Uh, so as we were ordering the laptops and getting them prepped, uh, I had my team begin putting together uh, remote work training. We have all these tools. We've got, uh, we're, we have Office 365, we've got Microsoft Teams, we've got you know, all these tools to help us go remote. Um, but I knew that the organization had really never taken advantage of all the training we've done in the past. So we put together uh, last, this week, uh, we started developing it last week and we put it in place this week, um, hour long trainings every single day, teaching people everything that they needed to do, all the basics around how to operate Microsoft Teams, making sure that v you have a, you know, you know how to connect to a VPN, that what a soft phone is and how do you operate and how do you actually use it. If you're going to use GoToMeeting or Zoom, here's the basics around doing that. Um, and that helped, you know, with uh, driving down calls to the help desk as people got home for the first time and realized they didn't know what to do. You know, how do I even get connected? So we were in a race to put those communications in place, get the training in place, get all the equipment uh, that we actually needed uh, to, um, to anticipate this. And uh, this week we have been, uh, uh, as, as the different areas have become ready, they've been going, uh, going remote. Got it. Let me, I'm gonna pull us forward to a next, uh, the next section of this, which is putting our people first. Um, you, guys, you guys have already touched on this, both of you have, um, and, and some of the responses we got back echoed exactly what you shared. Um, do we have any roles in IT which are on premise um, in office and cannot be conducted remotely? What was clear in the responses was, well, less than 20% of those who responded said, yes, they do have that scenario. So there are some jobs, um, uh, specifically IT jobs, um, that have to remain in the office, whether it's in the manufacturing locations where equipment that's you know, heavy manufacturing or, or hardened systems have to be maintained. Um, and that requires hands-on keyboards. Um, or, um, we have people in some cases still in the office for break fix. Um, what's interesting to me is this survey response sample was over six days. And frankly, those six days the world that is North America changed drastically uh, in that period of time, the, the conditions we all were confronted with. Um, and I, I wonder a little bit if these survey answers are a little bit dated because most everyone is now, if you don't have to be in the office, you're being required to work from home. So I, I wonder if the break, break fix is still really as necessary because there won't be anyone else in the office. Um, but one thing that was shared um, that the data center management and facility management um, is necessary in some, of the, in some of the locations. And this person, I think they responded in, in sort of a broader way than just IT. But I, I recall having data centers in multiple parts of the world and, and some of those were, were uh, in areas of strife or crisis and getting people that sometimes was the safest place they could go um, or the most secure was the data center because there was nobody else there. Um, and on the other hand, it also was, was most certainly the most lonely um, circumstances because it was the only place where they were required. Um, and I think that's been one of the balancing thoughts I've had in my head as I think about this is 
you know, we have people that are, are consummate professionals. They've worked all their lives to be the best that they can be in technology. Many of them are veterans and, you know, have given a commitment to the country already. Um, and when you look at what it is that we're trying to do um, to maintain and operate these, these institutions as best we can, we still have to put those people first. Um, and I guess what I'd like to do maybe is ask, um, as I look down the list here, um, you know, Eric, you guys are working with, em, you know, employers all day long through, through the work that you guys are doing. Um, what are you encountering in the, in the staffing universe, in the search universe? And are you getting any sort of difference in requests on staffing and, and the people and where people are working? Has that already trickled through or are people still in reaction mode? I guess is a good question to ask. No, it's a, it's a great question. We are, we, we have the unique insight, I suppose, is not only just knowing how our organization is handling this, but working hand in hand with hundreds of other organizations. And, you know, I only have 250 internal employees, but we have over a thousand, you know, contract or temporary employees working off site with our clients. And the same challenges that we're talking about here and that everyone is facing, I mean, every organization is facing this. They're having shortages of hardware to provide their employees. Um, we've had requests to, to try and provide some of our equipment to our, to our contract employees as well. And it's, it's a unique challenge that I think what, what we'll hear today and continue to hear today is, is not necessarily unique across the industry and a lot of different companies are are struggling with how to how to keep people either employed I mean some people are literally gonna have to lay off folks if they can't do their jobs um, some some folks are opting to pay their employees even though they can't work they there's at least one client I'm, I'm aware of that said you know we're gonna pay you for the rest of this week we'll figure it out from there and take it week by week uh, but at the end of the day I mean people and companies still need to operate uh, companies still have projects that need completing, workers that need to get hired for it. And more or less, our standpoint is we've just transitioned to being full virtual. So instead of face-to-face -face interviewing thousands of candidates a week, we've entirely switched this to Zoom. And instead of going on site to client interviews and meetings, you know, we're conducting presentations via Zoom or possibly Microsoft Teams. And it, the, the people aspect of our business is the most impacted, I suppose, in terms of we, we literally shouldn't be talking <laughs> and shaking right. hands with people constantly. But the leveraging of video and either Zoom or Teams has, honestly, it's been fantastic. People are really picking it up quickly. Um, if, if anything, it's, it's, dry, it's almost force adopting people to learn these technologies and to know, oh my gosh, I can do this from my cell phone. I can do this from my own laptop. Because um, we work with a diverse group of you know, anybody in the city looking for a job or any company trying to hire. So just, just leveraging video as much as possible really can overcome that lack of face-to-face. -face. Got it. Well, I'm going to ask input here on the next area, um, leadership and how you're handling things differently in a time of crisis. Um, this one was a very interesting and sometimes um, personal sort of response. And you know, from the survey results, I, I copied and pasted samples. Um, and you'll see that throughout this deck. Um, but I, I'm gonna come uh, mark to you in a moment. Um, but the, the leadership answers were, were very telling. And, if you, and we'll be later in the deck as well. There's some other insights that make me feel rather good about the state of Chicago. Um, but everything from trusting the team and expecting that they'll be online to do what needs to be done, dealing with the fact that working across five time zones, virtual already was a, a business model. Um, the one that I thought was interesting from just sort of a prioritization, and I've begun to see this, is prioritizing communications channels, using email for standard updates, team channels for work streams, and groups, texts for critical questions, and then video calls for daily or weekly catch-ups. Um, just articulating that in the culture, not just sort of letting it figure its way out, but 
articulating, here's how we're going to do these things. That definitely provides clarity in this time, you know, where you might have otherwise grabbed a coffee or caught someone at a, at a water, you know, water stop or gone to their office or after a meeting, pulled them aside. These are the new ways of engagement. And I think that's one of the keys that is out there. Um, but also daily communications, providing a continuous mode of communicating um, has been a, a common theme throughout all the responses. Now, Mark, um, I, why I wanted you to respond on this um, is you're in an organization that's, that's probably going nonstop right now. Um, and I'd love to get sort of your view, how you're helping um, your own team understand the importance of what they're doing um, and how you keep people motivated and, and moving forward in this time of uncertainty. Oh my God, this is a good question. I've actually uh, had made some suggestions uh, to the company because, you know, because we're getting calls, we're getting, you know, our customers are calling, they're looking for things. Imports are cut off where we make things in the USA too. So they need products and the demand's been going up at the same time. You know, how do you communicate that to a workforce when everybody else they know, you know, their places are shutting down. So, you know, we try to focus on the positive. Number one is look, it's important you know, what we're doing is really important and um, having people see the value, but also it's also important to have balance. So we've been very clear uh, in the communications across with everyone in terms of, um, we already follow procedures, um, you know, for um, sanitation, right? Just our, our typical audits that we do anyway, but uh, we already have those procedures, but on top of that, um, we have to make accommodations. So just taking everything on a case by case basis and making sure everybody's, uh, for me, I'm just making sure every, what everybody is doing is something they're comfortable with and swapping it out if we need to do something different. So, you know, um, in terms of leading IT, making sure, you know, is everyone comfortable and what do we need? We've also changed a few things. Um, we don't do the walk up, social distancing, things like that. You know, we've encouraged people and said push back. And if, and if someone says, well, you know, the rest of us aren't doing that, we're gonna say, well, yeah, but we are. Um, because we have to be here to support you. So those gotcha. are just things. Also trying to look ahead because a lot of business stuff is looking straight down about what's coming down the road. So I don't know if other people are picking it up, but I'm hearing a lot, a lot of different industries, cash flow is becoming a huge thing, you know, because it's just, it's right, it's a trickle down. You know, people are like, we have business interruptions, so we're gonna hold off on paying some things and then that goes down the supply chain. Then the next person wants to hold up. And I think that's going to be the critical thing for every company. Yeah. Good point. All right. Let me move us to just sort of some ready readiness points. Um, remote working. Uh, one of the key questions that uh, I know we all are facing is how do you provide capability where you haven't necessarily had it in the past? Something as fundamental as do you have laptops for people or what do you do about it? Um, and the responses we got back, I thought were interesting. Um, you know, less than 30% said, yes, we have laptops for everyone, which kind of scans when you think about the response earlier that 75% or 76% were on premise anyway. Um, but the other part of it is um, some percentage of the workforce, the, the yellow bars, basically there's a mix 50, 50 or something laptops and desktops provided. And then down at the bottom, there's the, we provide equipment and we allow access from home. Um, Badri, if I could ask your help, um, what are you seeing at Octave Group? What are you, what are you seeing you know, unfold as you look? Because it's a global workforce, right? It's not just domestic. You know, what do you see unfolding around the, around the world when it comes to this? Well, one of the things, at least from our perspective, one of the big things was how do we, when I started, we had a mix of both uh, desktops and laptops. And given that we're in the music and video production industry, it was not necessarily the easiest decision to say, we're going to go all in and buy transportable end user devices. But that was a decision we made a while ago only because it was you know, Christian to a certain extent to say how it was part of our overall BCP plan to say from a continuity perspective, if people have to come into the office, kind of eliminates 
our puts a risk factor into our BC plan. Mm -hmm. Let's make them all, let's give everybody the ability to work remotely. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, just having the end user device doesn't necessarily do much because if you can't connect to services and all the services are in the building, you kind of, you're still um, hamstrung. So two part process was moving users to transportable devices, but also moving our backend services, uh, transitioning to full cloud, whether it's Salesforce for our sales and customer service functions, or moving all on-prem hardware to either a, a private cloud colo facility or full-on cloud solutions. Yeah. That combination kind of helped move. And I think over time helped us, especially in where we are today, right? If that didn't exist, uh, I wouldn't be online. I'd be on the other end of this conversation trying to understand how and what we needed to do to kind of make the transition. Uh, that I think definitely helped us. And mm -hmm. I, as we go and from, I think I read something last night, this morning, uh, we're looking at this going through the summer. And if that happens, more and more companies will be forced into a, a remote workforce for everybody that is capable of working or can work remotely. And right. then the question becomes, how do you support, how do you create an infrastructure that can support it? Um, it something that I haven't run into, but um, just before we started, there was a really good conversation on timing conference calls. Do yeah. you start at the top of the hour or do you start 15 minutes on either side of the hour so you don't run into the typical top of the hour meeting schedule where there's a network overload for all the people that are dialing in from home. Mm -hmm. And that is something that we need to kind of think we need to get prepared for. Yeah. I think it's those, those uh, long game scenarios that uh, I think the more thoughtful IT leaders I'm talking with, including this group, um, I think that's coming into, into focus really quick is this is not going to be four weeks. This isn't going to be six weeks. This is going to be months. And we've got to find the right path economically and operationally ahead so that the people who can operate and do what they can, can do that. Um, and it's, it's going to make, it's going to make a lot of topics that previously I think were taboo. Nobody would touch, nobody would, would uh, contemplate a change workforce wise those are, are going to be uh, possible to, to challenge and change um, just because it has to be in this time. Um, one of the areas, uh, and I, I'm going to come back to a couple of the other folks here that, that uh, we've already touched on, it's already come up in the, in the hour, um, is email platforms. Um, and I saw a note uh, before lunch about how Microsoft has made I think it's E1, which is their, their enterprise cloud license available and Teams is available for free for a period of six months or something to that effect. But I think even it's broader than that. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what the details are, so I'm gonna go reread that. Um, but what I did see almost to, to a complete answer here, I think we only had less than 5% of the respondents who are in the migration mode right now. The vast majority of of chapter member firms um, are are a hundred percent cloud based for email now, and I I can't imagine. I mean, that just blows my mind. Five years ago, that that was even possible, um, but here we are. Um, do you have any reservations about it? That was sort of my second thought when I was looking at that last night with a with a Guinness or a glass of uh, whiskey. Was um, I wonder if there's any reservations about having so much in Microsoft's basket or in some other other people's data center. Um, and Rick, I'm going to start with you since you have, you know, people coast to coast and you've got students, you've got faculty, you've got staff, you've got a very diverse ecosystem of users. Um, what are you guys doing? Uh, and what are your thoughts about uh, single sourcing through say Microsoft or Google or someone? Well, we got kind of a mixed bag. I mean, when it comes to the platform, Office 365, we've pretty much standardized around that. Uh, mainly because Microsoft is so good to education. 
And so mm -hmm. it makes a lot of sense for us to take advantage of Office 365, provide that to all of our students for very, very, uh, very cheaply to do that for our students. So it makes a lot of sense to do that. Now the other, so when we comes to th that platform, um, you know, that's what we use. Uh, we haven't gone all in on, um, you know, Skype for business, although it's used now kind of as part of Microsoft Teams. So we've got Zoom and we've got GoToMeeting uh, for video conferencing. Uh, so we, and then we look at uh, when it comes to the infrastructure piece of it, you know, we use a piece of Amazon, we use a piece of Azure, and we're starting to use uh, GCP as well, or uh, Google Cloud. Uh, so for us, it kind of depends on the application. We haven't really decided to standardize on any specific platform, and I don't think I want to. I don't think that it's necessary for us to. You yeah. know, some people, it used to be the argument, are you going to go AWS or are you going to go Azure? And I, you know, I, I don't think that that's necessary anymore. Uh, you know, I think you, I think you've got to use whatever is appropriate uh, for for the team or for the application. We do have a, I mean, we do have a lot invested in Microsoft. Uh, you know, there's no question about that. Uh, but we are, uh, you know, trying to use as many different uh, cloud providers as we can, depending on what the application is. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Absolutely. Really asking. No, no, that's exactly what I was looking for. Um, and before I move on to collaboration, because that's the next slide, is the collaboration choices, um, I'll open up to the rest of the panelists. Does anybody else, you know, speak up here? Scott, Rick, or well, Rick, I already talked to you, Eric, Mark, Padre. Um, do you guys have any further thoughts on email platforms and single sourcing or multi-sourcing or, you know, what are your thoughts in general on email? I think that uh, the, the single sourcing and multi-sourcing is really a question of what your business needs are. So um, at my current organization, we are pseudo-governmental, which means we're a standalone organization that doesn't take any tax dollars. We run it for profit. We've got a board of directors and all that. We're created by state statute. So we have some, we have some definitions of what our business records and what are not. We have some requirements around freedom of information um, requests and being able to service them in, in the correct way that most organizations, well, every organization I've worked at before does not have. So for us, the ability to centralize your data, to manage that data, to actually back up your cloud data. So we actually, we have backups of our cloud data on-prem in addition to everything else. Um, moving to a multi-platform cloud provider scenario would be very, very problematic for us. So stay, we, we, we work today with Azure and they have a government offering that's, that's, uh, that provides a security layer that level that is just not found in the, in the other platforms. Also provides integrated e-discovery across all of their offerings included in, uh, in, in the Office 365 suite and it also extends into their, their other platform as a service and, and, and just storage as a service. So for us, the centralization of our cloud, our, our cloud presence is key to our strategy as an organization, both for business continuity, as well as for lowering the costs of overall execution. So a little different scenario than, than what Rick has. Yeah, got it. And I'll, All right, I'll just, I'm going to keep this. Go, go ahead. I'll, let, let me take one more comment, and then we'll move on. Go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to add on to that. That uh, I, I had those fears of having the, that single vendor as well. But with the current state, if anything, we're pushing more things into Microsoft at this time, um, without people all needing those local share drives and things on prem. Moving that more into OneDrive, SharePoint, and Teams. It's yes, it's more of a single ecosystem, but it's also much more convenient and accessible for our workers to be able to execute. So I, I think it's been a good thing thus far. Got it. Thank you, Eric. All right, so let's take the conversation to the next logical place, which is collaboration. Uh, you know, here we are on Zoom. Uh, you could call it a collaboration platform. Uh, just don't call it a comeback. And, uh, but you could look at certainly Skype, you could look at every internet platform ever invented. You could look at Teams, um, you name it. Um, but what I found interesting in the results that came back is yes, the vast majority are using a cloud-based one today. And 
whether it's Dropbox or, you know, it's file-based or it's process-oriented or it's something that's embedded in your productivity suite, um, very few companies are on-premise today with collaboration. Um, I'm curious to understand, are you finding in this stress test, which is what we're in in some ways, are you finding what you had chosen as your collaboration platform was the right play? I guess that's a, and it's, it's institution by institution, right? There's no good answer for everybody, but I'm curious what you're observing as, as the days and weeks grind on and, and what you're thinking now. Um, and maybe if I could, uh, Mark, start with you and ask, you know, are you, are you seeing utilization as you expect or, you know, are you starting to see changes or cracks or would you prefer something else? Oh. So we were a little bit different in that we were pretty far ahead on Skype. For example, I mean, so you probably hear my office phone ringing. That's always an outside call from a vendor. All of our internal calls are through Skype. No one calls office to office on our actual telephone. So all of our meetings are Skype and they're not dial in. We, our dial in is there, but we, we check it. It's, it's minimal. If there's a couple calls a month that where people actually dial in, it's, it's uh, that's about the top. So we had that, but the, File and print server stuff, that's a bottleneck, and that's some of the things. Maybe we'll get in that in the few, you know, down the road in the deck here, but that's one of the bottlenecks that are out there because people want to have a shared drive for their team, but their team is off-site. So the teams that are moved more to Teams or to SharePoint sites or even and not so much OneDrive, but you know, when you're there, that makes it a lot easier to not be having to be present on site. Right. Also, it gives you flexibility that if you have to go from a desktop to a laptop, if your files are mostly on OneDrive, as soon as you get that laptop and you log into the domain, you inherit all your information that you normally have on that device. Got it. Yeah. Padre, how about yourself? How are things going multinational? No, uh, what Mark said is very true, right? For us, we've, in addition to, I mean, both Mark said it and Scott said it. Uh, we're primarily a 365 shop, but for email, calendaring, scheduling, stuff like that, but and file and print file storage services, we've been moving all of our on-prem file storage to 365. So it's available, accessible across no matter where you are. The other thing is instead of, uh, we have groups within the company that use Teams if they are working on specific projects but across the com company, everybody uses Slack. So we have Slack global for the entire company, company-wide messaging. So if there's a urgent anything that needs to go out, just put it in the company-wide Slack channel, everybody's automatically notified, go read. But otherwise, uh, team. So for us, it's been, it's been a critical part of our overall strategy to be able to keep our global uh, users on the same page. Yeah, that's one, that, that's one question I had in my head is we have so many platforms to play with. How can you keep everybody aware of what they need to be aware of through one, one mode or one channel? Other thoughts? Anyone else? Yeah. You know, as we've, uh, if you read LinkedIn, there's articles lining up and down your feed about the the opportunity to do even more remote work. We have been challenged the last few years with getting people to use any of these tools. Um, just, it, it's not ingrained in the, the DNA of our organization. And we've been remote now three days, one day mandatory, two days optional. And uh, today uh, we, we, we chuckled because we had someone say, you know, Skype and Teams is just the, the best thing. It's better than the phone. And, and I'm more in contact with my team than I ever have been, you know, in the past. And, and gosh, we should be using this every day, at, whether we're at the office or not. And uh, so I love the way that, that technology is, is just very, so very rapidly changing the way our business leadership and our line folks think about how they do their day-to-day -day work. Yeah. And for us, it has put front and center the opportunity to significantly, potentially significantly increase the, how we approach uh, remote work, which has not, been, has, has not been deeply run through our organization. So the transformation over the last three business days has been 
phenomenal inside our organization. I'd, I'd be curious to know if anyone else is seeing that same kind of thing. Well, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that, Scott. One of the things we have, we've been seeing that as well as people realize they have all these tools that they never used before. One of the things I've been thinking about a lot lately is what does this mean after this is all over? Yes. As people become comfortable working remotely and if they're very effective at doing it, how is that going to change our organization long term? Uh, how is it going to change how people work long term? How is it going to change perhaps hiring practices long term? And how is that going to change how our work is, is actually accomplished long term? And I don't have the answer to that. But I've been thinking about it a lot as people now are adopting this and showing that they can be effective working remotely and some like it. Yeah. Real estate's a whole different game in the very near future. Yep. All right. Um, let me bring us to a slide that I know my colleague, Mike Fesco, uh, with CBiz is, is on our session today as well, is probably close to his heart, looking at things like ERP and the financial platforms that run our companies and HRIS and all of the other back office systems. You know, the things that, are, that make us different, different industries, different sectors, different uh, services. Um, are usually the front office things. You know, it's the stuff that people buy from us one way or another. The things that run our businesses in many ways are very common. Um, some are used in some ways differently industry and sector by sector, um, but they, they provide the same functionality and capability. When I, when I looked at the results on this last night, and I was, because I, I thought about every one of these questions, and I, I wondered, you know, a couple of thoughts probably after each one of these, um, this is uh, a question that could be read and interpreted several different ways. I, I read this in the responses, at least as, okay, we're not, not everybody has their ERP in the cloud, or at least it's unlikely based upon the, the demographics of those responding that everybody had 82% had their ERP in the cloud. Um, but they are providing it to their remote workers, um, to ensure continuity. So that to me implies, and this is probably bears some validation today, or at least some discussion, that there's a VPN or remote access component somehow, some way coming into play. Um, I know HR, ADP, and several other platforms are wholly portal-based, web-based, I get it. Um, marketing, sales, you know, all of those platforms are certainly cloud-oriented. Some of the document and file management, um, legal and contracts, you know, DocuSign taking the cake there, risk assessments, compliance, a lot of those are, are subscription and portal services. And enterprise reporting, um, you know, those are, are becoming more and more cloud enabled. But I'd love to get from the panel your thoughts right now as to how you're providing access to ERP and your financial platforms. And then also if you have a minute to share on the HR. Um, and I thought I'd start first, um, Mark, if you could just share, share with us what's going on in your organization. Uh, so most of it, uh, we don't have data center. Uh, it's hosted, you know, by a commercially available place. Um, but, uh, Citrix and BBM. And that's, that's the work, the most work we had to do is cause that's where one of the bottlenecks is. Uh, maybe other people are like that when we set that up, that was more of a nice to have versus a have to have. So mm -hmm. that was the first place to check is what happens if, what's our cap on people going VPN through Citrix to get to the ERPs. Got it. And HR, is that also? Uh, that is, is, uh, we're all T pro, so that's all cloud. Got it. And I think that's, that's more common. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, Rick, how about yourself? So uh, we use Workday for HR and financials. Uh, so it is in the cloud and we use Salesforce, Office 365. We do have a couple of applications that run our student information system uh, that they, you'd have to use VPN to get in uh, to, to access, which is why we had to put that training together. Uh, you know, one of the things that was very important for us is we have MFA in front of all of those, including VPN. So you've got to, you've got to um, use multi-factor to get into anything. Right. Uh, so, when, you know, we, we're lucky that we put a lot of things in the cloud over the last several years, but we do have to utilize VPN for those back office systems, which required a lot of training to get everybody kind of ready for that. Got it. Uh, let me go down the list here. Eric, how about yourself? 
Yeah, we uh, we do still have a few systems for back office to access via VPN. Um, I made sure to prioritize that they did receive corporate owned laptops with uh, you know, good security and Global Protect installed. And I mean, I've even had a, a person ahead of time take home a desktop computer, set up two screens because they knew them struggling <laughs> to, to process payroll for a thousand people, for example, is while it might be technically possible on one screen, it's gonna be real difficult. Yeah. So making sure to give them focus and planning ahead of time, uh, in particular, the back office. You know, IT is back office, got a special place in our hearts to, to take care of our fellows. So um, mix of VPN, but always with corporate uh, managed devices. Got it. Padre, how about yourself? Something Eric just said, right? Um, the one thing that we hadn't accounted for was the fact that pretty much everybody in every office environment has at least two screens, if not more, depending on which group they're in. Mm -hmm. um, when we had to close offices, that was the one big thing was literally everybody backed their car up, picked up the two monitors that were at their desk and went home. Because uh, th that's the one thing we'd never accounted for was the fact that people get used to working with dual monitors and mm -hmm. all of a sudden getting stuck with one 15 inch screen, not as productive. Um, so we had a bunch of people take stuff, but coming back to the slide, uh, we do have our ERP financials and enterprise reporting is in-house and those you do have to connect by VPN. Uh, everything else is cloud-based. Um, Dayforce for HR, sales, customer service, marketing, document management, Salesforce, DocuSign. Uh, so again, for some things we use VPN to connect in, but that's a pretty small group. Uh, cool. Most of the, for the most part, users can use, if they choose to, they could not even use their work computer. They could use their home computers because they're basically logging into Salesforce or Dayforce. Got it. Thank you, sir. Scott, how about you, sir, to finish this up? We have a mix, but we're also wrestling with, we have, all of our employees have two monitors. So we're getting complaints about that from productivity. Our, uh, our human resource system is we're ADP. Um, so that's all coming in through the cloud. Our, our financials are on a JD Edwards platform deployed internally. Um, we expect to move that over the next couple of years and take that off prem. We've eliminated all Citrix completely from our environment, both from a, from a complexity cost and security perspective. So we're not doing any of that. Uh, what we do have is we've got uh, virtual desktops deployed in the cloud to, to uh, access anything old client server-ish kind of things. Um, and we've got the VPN to get to our internal network. We have about 60% of our application portfolio deployed in the cloud today. So, um, and, and, and we're moving more and more there. So the reliance on VDI, virtual desktops uh, and VPN is, is lessening, but it's, it's far from gone. Hey Rob, I got a question that kind of related to this and I'd love, like to hear the panel give some thoughts on it, if that's okay. Sure, go for it. The, um, so Badger, you brought up, you know, dual monitors. So did you, Scott, you know, I, it was our policy that they couldn't take home any of their, their equipment from the office and take it home that they'd have to figure out a way to either purchase it on their own or, or deal with it without. Um, but it, this brought up when the executive team, we were talking, it brought up a larger issue just around expenses, uh, at home. And, you know, what do we do about that as we're telling people they need to work from home there are going to be certain expenses that they, they start to accumulate. And uh, we, we had thought about, uh, you know, whether or not we give uh, uh, employees a stipend to kind of cover those rather than trying to deal with them individually. We ne no one, you know, some people argued that we're well, working from home, you know, they, they actually save on it, some expenses over here. So maybe that balances it out that they have to, you know, pay for extra over here. I'd love to hear, is anyone else kind of dealing with that? Uh, at an executive level and, and what are you doing about it? Rick, we've actually told anybody that didn't want to take a, do, take their monitors home, we've given them the option of just buying monitors uh, and expensing it. But from a pure network connectivity perspective, um, it's an ongoing discussion, no decision yet. 
we're trying to figure out what's the right number. If we're going to pay people who, are, who we forced to work from home, is there a logical number where you could go, everybody gets X mm -hmm. uh, for internet connectivity? Because in some cases, not all of our employees have cell phones. And if they have to dial into conference calls, uh, and if they're not using a computer, then the question is, then what? So a um, combination of situations that we're trying to wrestle down purely in terms of, as you put it, managing expenses. In the short term, something we're discussing, um, trying to figure out what that number, magical number is. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll just chime in with, uh, as far as people taking equipment home, um, Thankfully, we're in a, a smaller organization, just a couple hundred people. I probably couldn't do this for a 5,000 type person organization, but generally speaking, our CEO stance is if, if we can get them equipment that's gonna help them work, let's do it. And it's, it's eventually, or essentially just turns down into coordination of tracking you know, what asset ends up walking out the door, making sure that it's gonna come back at the end of this, and I mean, if any of you have worked off a single screen, <laughs> it's really rough for, for a lot of people once you get used to that two screen. So I have, I have nothing but empathy for our staff that are struggling on a small laptop or Chromebook. And it's, if, if I can help them, if I can run a, meet them in the office, hand them a monitor or just direct them as to, okay, you need this adapter to work with your home PC. You know, that's, that's what we're doing on a case by case basis. Just trying to have empathy for people. One of the interesting parts that we ran into the same thing with dual monitors, but we've got a form factor issue. Our monitors are, are bolted to the desktop with two arms, which is, and they're flexible and you can make them configure mm -hmm. however you like them, which is wonderful at the desk. But instead of being able to pick up a monitor with a base and carry it home with you, we don't have a practical way of sending our monitors home. So, that was a little bit of a surprise as, as, as we've encountered the feedback about the, about the dual monitors here. Mm -hmm. We're in a little bit of an interesting situation. Give you a little more respect in IT, being able to unscrew those and, and carry them off easily. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Scott, you're right, right? For us, um, anybody that had bolted monitors with, um, yeah, essentially monitors bolted to the desk, obviously couldn't take them home. They ended up, we just told them just go buy a monitor or buy a really long cable, plug it into your TV at home and you can use your TV as a second monitor in a, in a pinch if you need to. But uh, otherwise, anybody that had a sit stand desk basically took their monitors home. Yeah. Uh, something I did want to mention as we get close to the top of the hour here, um, we have probably about 10 or 11 more slides to go and all of this is gold. Um, I'd love for our, our panelists to stay with, and if the audience can stay with, awesome. Um, but I, I did wanna just mention that, that I, I recognize that we, we are going along and it's, it's frankly for a great reason. So hopefully that works for your schedule. I anticipate we'll be done within 30 more minutes. So uh, if you can stick with us, great. If you need to peel off, I understand we are recording this. And for as long as we can talk, we will record it and save it out for everyone. So. Um, let me keep us moving on here. Um, on the operation sides of, of what we're doing, um, there are some pretty interesting themes that have, that have come forward. One of those being the necessity of an emergency communication plan. You know, this is sort of core common sense, you know, BCP 101, but you're now putting it to the test, right? You now have people having to communicate. And I've, I've witnessed this at CBIS where we've seen a steady stream from, from the chief of staff until we got to a critical conversation um, with the CEO who needed to let everyone in the company, all 5,000 of us know certain things needed, needed to be important and everyone's health and safety was number one, that we all needed to be worried about that first and to make safe, healthy choices for ourselves. Um, I, I've actually been pretty impressed with how C business handled it. Um, but I am curious, you know, as you guys look at your own emergency plans and methods, um, are you are you getting what you need out of it? Are you have you found any surprises? Are you hit any bumps in the road um, in the in the journey? 
anyone care to share? Let me start with just maybe Rick and I'll do one or two others and we'll keep moving here. Um, so is the, Rob, is the question, can, can you ask it one more time? Sure, the, the simple question is with, um, everybody has some form of emergency communications. Are you finding the plan that you had in place and the tools meeting the needs or are there other things you're doing now to complement? That's probably the best way to, to paraphrase. So I, I think, you know, we did have uh, an emergency man, uh, emergency alert system in place. Um, we found that, um, you know, we're kind of using a combination of the two of just regular email communications and then uh, only the emergency uh, communications, um, you know, for, um, for something that's more critical. So we, we ended up not really using it as much and just trying to be more thoughtful around our communications, unless we were trying to blast out text messages for some reason to uh, a large group of staff, maybe at a particular location. If, um, you know, if this county, um, you know, or this area uh, just, you know, said that they were closing down uh, uh, businesses or, or shelter in place for this area and it affected one of our locations and we might send out text messages for that. Uh, otherwise, uh, we've just been using uh, email to get those, uh, to get those communications out. Got it. And that's um, consistent, I think, with several of the comments that we saw that came back in the survey. Um, there are pre-written comms that have been written or, or can be tweaked on many companies' shelf, um, but those are now being modified as the situation dictates. Um, one of the things that struck me, one of the respondents has an integrated television station. Um, I don't even know what that means. It sounds very interesting, um, but it feels like that they can broadcast out to all of their campuses a common video broadcast message at the same time. I think that's what that implies. Um, that's actually, that's me, Rob. Oh, and, there we uh, go. Tell me, there's, tell a me more, there's a service in Chicago that allows you to connect into television stations to make announcements, closures, anything like that. It's, it's under a hundred dollars a year and we have it to be able to make announcements where all of the other types of communications are not available. So if we need to put something on the WGN ticker or wherever else, we can go, we can go do that. So that, that multi-tiered communication approach is, is very important. Wow, that is fascinating to know and, and I'll be watching WGN more now. Um, <laughs> that's, that's some cool stuff. I'd love to add one thing here. Sure. Um, one thing that, I, that I've been very happy with with my organization is with our CEO, Tom Gimbel. Um, for most of these communications, not relying on any type of mass email or text or anything like that. Um, we've had daily all company Zoom meetings or town halls where we hear directly from him exactly, you know, where we're at that day, latest news, expectations, and the face-to-face -face aspect and being able to ask questions and answers. Um, I think has been the most effective communication channel. Uh, people can infer reading and emails differently and they'll react differently. But when you have people on, on camera able to, you know, really show their face and just be human, it's, uh, it's gone a long way. Yeah. I think that's one of the key elements has been the humanity of this, of this opportunity. That's um, and, uh, go ahead quickly. One more comment on there. I don't I haven't found this to be a tools based issue and I don't think it is a tools based issue for most people right there's a small segment of our organization that does have remote workforce the people on call have dealt with offshore onshore probably the majority of our careers so we're used to it but there are a lot of people who aren't used to it so we ended up spending time with our leadership team talking about how to keep engaged with, on a human level when people aren't in front of you what do you need to do? What are the different behaviors? What do you need to look for? Those types of things. And I think that's been more important for us from a success of communication perspective than the toolkit that we have. The toolkits seem pretty ubiquitous. You know, we've all got pretty much the same ones, but the skill in using them, I think is, is the real critical success factor there. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think it's something we can bring to the table as, as IT leaders that uh, often other folks cannot.
because we probably do more of it than most other most other people in the organization. Yeah. Thank you, Scott. Uh, telecoms and data centers. Um, you know, the question was asked, do you feel you have sufficient bandwidth and capacity to operate for extended periods of time with high levels of remote workers? And the overwhelming answer, as you can see here, is yes. Um, and I guess to the panel, does anybody here feel differently than, than maybe when they responded on the survey? You know, has, has the situation changed? Are you still feeling good about performance and what you have in the way of bandwidth into your facilities and then presumably what your workers have at, at their remote location? The biggest challenge I've been finding with our telecoms is the variance in people's home connections. You know, if a lot of people are on Wi-Fi, that can be inconsistent. They may be, you know, 100 yards from their their access point, and you know, it's a mix of of using Wi-Fi, dropping off cellular, but by and large, it's it's worked remarkably well. I've been very happy with it, and it's been able to quickly, you know, enable our workforce to entirely work from home and. and especially for us, the soft phone aspect was very important because our staff of recruiters is having to call many different outside people and doing that with their personal cell phones opens up a whole nother can of worms of sharing your personal data now with unknown, unknown people. And so mm -hmm. being able to use a soft phone with your work caller ID, still having that kind of business continu continuity aspect and anonymizing their personal device um, that's been working great, but from, from a tech standpoint, it's really just the variance in how well people's home router is, their home network, and we've been troubleshooting a fair amount of that, but it's, it's not insurmountable. It's, it's manageable. Yeah. Any other impressions or thoughts? You know, one thing we found was we weren't ready for um, the licensing around the VPN, with, um, so we had to up, up that quickly to make sure we could handle um, the licensing around that for uh, simultaneous connections on our firewalls. Um, so um, that was one thing. The other, with the other one on the internet, uh, it was that we found uh, we've been pointing people to um, to Xfinity, Charter, and Cox um, as internet providers. They're all offering uh, either 30 or 60 day free for any new customers uh, with no yeah. contract. Uh, which has been helping uh, with uh, some of the folks that didn't have internet at home. We got a question from the audience asking about minimum minimum network speeds. Is anybody providing guidance on that right now? It's so tough. Why we got asked that question during a town hall? It it's tough because you don't know how many people they have in their house. Uh, you know, is everybody on Netflix simultaneously? Do they have kids that are on YouTube? It's it's really tough to give that guidance without knowing more about them. Yeah. Um, the minimum, I think the minimum speeds now that Comcast is doing is 25 megs down, um, uh, which if, in, you know, if you're a single person living alone, that's going to be enough. If you've got three kids who like to stream all day long, it's not going to be. Uh, so it's, it's so tough to, to give guidance on. I think a lot of it is going to depend on the technology. I've been doing this for probably the last five years. Most of the communication issues, I'll just pick on Skype. Most of them are the device and the home Wi-Fi. Uh, and it's not so much their connection to Xfinity, it's their connection between the device and the Wi-Fi. Um, and, uh, and a lot of the technologies, even the one we're using, it will scale the service levels to meet what's out there. So you can do, I've done video Skype sessions off of a MiFi, off of a conference room. So that's the, if there's issues, that's usually where, I'm, where I've always seen them. The device, oh, okay. the, the microphones and the headsets, especially. Got it. Thanks, Mark. All right. Um, this is, I'm going to take a, a moment or two extra here between this one and the next slide, which is about co cross coverage for IT. Um, and supporting break fix uh, in this era that we're in now is not exactly as straightforward as it used to be. Some of the responses we got in, you can scan here on the screen. Every, everyone's doing everything from direct shipments to meeting people in the office to sending a loaner um, uh, to looking at Geek Squad at, at Best Buy and Apple Business. And now Best Buy and Apple Business are, are either closing or have limited hours. Um, 
what are you guys doing when it comes to, oh my gosh, my laptop just broke, what do I do, sort of scenarios? Uh, let me start with Scott, how about you? Well, we still, uh, we are not big enough to have an outsourced support organization. So our support organization internal. So what we're doing is uh, we've defined as part of our essential personnel, um, our, our service desk. So once a week, if there is an approved, if there's an approved uh, trip to the trip to the city, once a week, we will be on site to provide in person technical support. The rest of it is we've got a, a full suite of remote support products that allow us to go and, and perform pretty much anything except for physical brake fix mm -hmm. on, a, on a computer. That's the way we're approaching it right now. Our, our call volume is not significantly high on a, on a per person basis. So it works for us. Okay. Uh, Badri, how about yourself, sir? For us, um, we have an even, well, even split between Macs and Windows. So on the Apple end of things, relatively stable, not as problematic. If we did, I have no idea what we would do because we end up buying most of our Macs from Apple. Uh, given that all of their stores are closed, it would be interesting to, that's something we hadn't quite planned for or accounted mm -hmm. for, something we need to figure out how, we're go how we will support those users. Uh, but in the short term, what we ended up doing is for both uh, Macs and Windows end user devices, we just bought extra spares um, that we will, in case if, if remote support doesn't work and service desk is unable to address the issue, then we will just ship them the replacement and then figure out the fix how to fix the unit once our partner services are actually up and running. Got it. Eric, in your, your business, obviously everybody's remote now. Yep. Um, how are you guys looking at supporting remote break fix? Uh, it's been a busy couple of days for me the last few. Um, I, I took the head brunt of that and I got, I got two great, great workers on my team trying to help, but it's still just three people for you know, 200 plus folks. Mm -hmm. And it, it's been uniquely challenging. Uh, I'd say 30% or so of our staff said that they had their own computer, MacBook, laptop. Um, what we found over the, these first couple of days of working from home is that those devices aren't necessarily as fast as they hoped. <laughs> they have a little more issues, had someone literally dusting it off from the closet and like, okay, this will work. But when it's going under the stress test, some of them are failing and we, I mean, my team provides remote support as best we can to an extent. I mean, join a Zoom, go through Teams, screen share. Um, you can do a lot of the basics, but it's several times now, just in the last few days, we've had to say, okay, this computer is not really going to work for you. Let's uh, have you come into an office and, and grab a spare, spare Chromebook. We, uh, we typically don't work with Chromebooks, but we need a laptops fast, something that could enable our folks. And we are predominantly cl cloud-based, so most of our staff can at least function via a Chromebook. And so we're swapping out their bad device with you know, a Chromebook that we were able to receive and more or less up and running. It's been going okay. Cool, thank you, sir. Um, cross coverage. Uh, let me start with Rick, your thoughts on this. How are you doing cross coverage and operation support during, during this time? Um, how are we doing cross coverage? So I'll give you one example of, of what we're doing. So we're, we're some of our uh, campuses um, are starting to close in California right now. And so we've got and, and as we've, uh, you know, as some of those campuses are starting, starting to close or the, uh, the workforce is uh, choosing uh, to, to work from home rather than come to the office, even in some of our other locations. And as our students have been transitioning to online from ground, we've seen a spike in the help desk, uh, which would, is pretty uh, natural for that to happen. So we've been using the site support folks that have been working on the ground and just adding them uh, into the help desk to take over those kinds of responsibilities. 
Uh, and then uh, for some of the infrastructure folks, uh, they've been helping to back up uh, a lot of the, uh, you know, particularly when we're trying to deploy, uh, you know, over a hundred laptops in a very short period of time, we had a lot of people that were helping back up, you know, that area of IT to help with deployment, training, and, uh, and, and everyone's been, uh, you know, really, really great. Uh, during uh, during the whole process, I saw a lot of, you know, you might get in a in your workforce during typical times if you said to a site support person or an engineer, hey, I need you to you know help out with the help desk, or I need you to help out with imaging machines, or I need you to help out something that's kind of you know very much outside the royal. You get a lot of grumblings about having to do that, but we're we're not seeing that right now. We're seeing everyone really pitch in and do and do the work and really being very willing to help out. Excellent. Plus one for humanity. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm going to keep us moving here because we've got about 15 more minutes till I'm going to try and be done with this. Um, vendor continuity and support. Um, I guess, Mark, I'd like to start, you know, kind of your thoughts on this. Um, have you had a chance to sit down with your providers in your ecosystem and understand how they're providing you support? Because you are part of a supply chain, right? And it's not only the manufacturing side, it's the IT side of it as well. Um, what, what are you seeing and what are you anticipating from your IT vendors when it comes to what they can do for you as they go into a remote mode as well? Yeah, they've, they've actually been pretty good and they've been pretty proactive. They actually, before we went to them, they've come back to us and said, this is what we're doing. Um, you know, our key one would be where we're hosting a lot of the, um, a lot of the ERP systems um, but they're, they're part of a banking uh, community, so we're in pretty good shape there. But most of the others have come back and, and really detailed out. I got one yesterday from Infor, um, detailing out where people are remote. They, all have, they have full capabilities. There will be no disruption in support. So really haven't had to go out that, uh, that way for, for it too much um, to find out what, what's going on out there. I think um, more on the business side, transportation and things like that. I, I've been spending more time on that because one of my people actually runs transportation. My former Pearson moved over to transportation. So mm -hmm. we still talk a lot about that side of the business. That's one where it's a little bit more, more Got it. Uh, for us. Got it. Scott, how about yourself in the vendor continuity universe? Well, we, we audit all of our vendors for SOC 2 compliance every year so we do we're, we're the money end of uh of affordable housing in the state of illinois so we don't we don't really take we don't engage with service providers who don't have a robust dr and business continuity capability in place so we have not been having thoughtful conversations or proactive as a matter of course of what's happening now but uh our vendors have responded just wonderfully and we have not seen any business interruptions from any organization so far. Excellent. Well, that's a good segue to information security. Um, let me move us to that topic here. Um, Eric, as, as you guys are operating in a remote model, how are you helping keep everybody front and center aware of their information security responsibility? Yeah, uh, training, making sure people are you know, storing things or, or keeping them within our systems. Um, most of our confidential data is either on-premise anyway and locked down to our HR staff and back office. Um, and yeah, just kind of keeping things within the CRM. Luckily, our, our company is mostly a, a people-based system and a lot of uh, our day-to-day -day operations are readily available on each person's LinkedIn page with their resume info. So haven't had to have drastic shifts in, in that regard, um, but it's certainly something that I'm gonna be monitoring closely and continue training our staff on. Got it. Badri, you're in a global organization. Uh, that always brings an extra layer or two of complexity with InfoSec. Uh, anything are you guys focused on? It does, and I think Eric hit the nail on the head, right? For us, we've had to go through a significant amount of training to just security awareness training for all employees. Just to just so they understand what information is and isn't secure and how what we are doing to keep it secure. But on the other hand, given this rapid increase in remote workforce, we, if from an IT perspective, we're also ramping up 
how we track and what we can do to better track what information is being moved either out of a cloud platform or not. Because it's once people are at home, it becomes a little more trickier to be able to restrict people from moving stuff. We license large volumes of music content. It would be very easy for somebody to just download an entire catalog from any, any of the music publishers. And next thing you know, we lose visibility to what happens with it. So one of the things we're trying, we're putting in place is how do we track who is downloading what content and making sure that they're actually on a company owned device. Got it. Okay. Thank you, sir. I think you do have to watch. I will say, um, you, unfortunately, right behind this, you know, the thieves are right behind it. So, um, we're watching for increase in phishing schemes. Also look for increase in a login attempt, especially office 365 from offshore. Um, there are ways to turn that off. And if you don't need it, you want to turn off that it's only North America because yeah, it's, it's right behind it. Right. And with remote workers, especially if you don't have, not used to having them, that the old vishing uh, of, hey, I'm, I'm working from home and I can't get in. And you told me I had to work, you know, <coughs> other person yeah. would be happening. Yeah, you know Mark, what? wire me some money, Mark. Well, it's, just, it's just to compromise the credentials. I can't log in. Can you reset my pad? That kind of, right? That's yeah. Right. Places that don't usually, you know, I'm remote and I can't get in. We sent out some communications yesterday to the to the employees around this the increased um, uh, attacks uh, targeting people that are working home uh, working from home specifically, uh, advising people, you know, a little bit around their home Wi-Fi network, making sure it's a strong password, you know, trying to make sure that they're heightened that. You know, there are people are going to try to take advantage of this situation and try to make money off this crisis. And so we were pretty, uh, you know, direct with our communications yesterday to our entire faculty and staff and students about that. So hopefully they read it, you know, and take it take it seriously. But you know, this new idea that the uh, the hackers now are going to start focusing on home networks because they're easier and uh, you know is is quite scary. Yeah, I'm looking more for denial of service to an area as a interruption of of commerce coming next if somebody goes after the routers that comcast or somebody's running um the the global attack profile changed for us which was very interesting to watch so we we know who's we know the ip addresses that are scanning our environments all constantly and, it, and it's it's the normal com countries you'd expect in russia china um middle eastern countries eastern europe but as the, as the coronavirus progressed through these countries, you saw China dropped off, just dropped off the map. It wasn't, wasn't even in the top 20. And as I went through the Middle East, those countries really dropped. And when it hit Europe, you know, those countries dropped and other ones popped up. So it was very, it was very interesting to see what was going on incoming, not just inside our organization yeah. um, in the world. I was surprised at the impact that, that, that it had on the bad guys out there. Yeah, the attack, the attack vector and the profile changed by due to the nature of the, the incident. Yep. Yeah. Let me talk about projects and priorities uh, and how those have shifted. And then I'm going to I'm going to walk us through the last bits of advice and then we'll be done. Um, you know, as as we are all in the business of doing things, you know, it's not just fixing continuously the IT that we have. We're contemplating new things or we're doing things that are in flight now. How are things shifting uh, for you? You know, that was the point of the question here. And what we're seeing is, uh, at least when the responses all came in, no def clear definitive decisions have been made. Um, but, you know, about at least 50% said that, that they were certainly contemplating it. 25% um, or so said, no, no, we're, we're good. We're going to keep doing what we're doing. And another, you know, 25% indicated they're gonna definitely revise expectations. Um, going back to my point earlier, this could have changed in the past 48 to 72 hours. Um, what are your thoughts? And Rick, I'm gonna go back to you because the video just popped back to you. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the, the reality is that we have to look at the timelines of our projects. We have, we have lost time uh, over the last two weeks. Um, trying to deal with this. And so the reality is we're going to be looking at those timelines, looking at those projects. 
both from just, you know, can we get it done in the time that we said it was given every, given the transition? How are people going to transition to remote work? It, are they going to still be effective? Is it, you know, what's the possibility that we keep the timelines? I think we're looking at that when we're also looking at expenses and capital projects that seemed important two weeks ago may not be as important now, given the uncertainty of what's going to happen with the economy. Well, you know, for us, uh, you know, looking at our, our enrollment for students and our tuition and our revenue, we're, there's a lot of uncertainty there. So we're looking at, you know, what, what was really priority a month ago and what's really priority today. And uh, we're struggling with that, to be honest. Yeah. Mark, how about yourself? Um, you know, I think we're staying on course with it, but we've got to be able to be agile and flexible because things are changing so often the, the needs are going to change too. So especially needs for data. Um, yeah. You know, because again, if we're taking in a lot of requests, what can we handle? And, you know, what's happening with things like order volumes and other things? Are we able to react to it? So, yeah. But for the most part, we're able to stay on, on course. Okay. Uh, Badri, how about yourself? Let me touch base with you so, before I move on. Well, we actually preemptively stopped all global projects. Any, any project that involved resources from multiple offices immediately went on a halt. We have we actually pushed a global integration project now that was three months in into a nine month project has now been rescheduled for Jan of, to start Jan of 2021. So we just pushed stuff out and we're essentially refocusing and saying, we'll focus on projects. We'll spend time on projects that involve resources in a single time zone. And then we'll address each piece individually because uh, given the global workforce and there's no easy answer to one size fits all. So we're anything that's global or multi-office canned or rescheduled for later this year through next year. Um, single office, we'll continue on. Got it. All right, let me just read this to everyone here. Um, and then I'm gonna move into the, the advice from peers, which I think is probably the gold uh, it's the last five minutes of our time together too. Um, you know, the priorities that were reported or shared, you know, projects that required heavy travel obviously stopped, full stop. Um, and non-essential travel, this obviously that answer came in late last week. Uh, now non-essential travel is just a no-go. Um, more local support suppliers for small office site locations. Um, checking bandwidth needs. Um, and making certain that our people that are remote have the devices they needed. Um, I'm, you know, the one that caught me, caught my eye was the reaction time. This was, this was late last week, this was reported, but reaction time to get our New York and Washington offices to go full remote in less than a week. Um, and I don't know if that's anyone that's here on the call today, but I have to say that that's, that's an incredible shift, incredible lift of efforts. Um, and can only imagine the amount of work that went into that. Um, and I think that's where some of this is beyond beyond the obvious, beyond the BCP that we had that was, you know, impactful to one location or one city or one state. This is a national implication and it's got a long-term view. And I think that's where a lot of people are beginning to shift to their thinking is what does this mean for the longer term? You know, from an operation standpoint, from an IT standpoint, from a, from a business standpoint, what does this mean? Um, let me take us into advice. Um, and this is, um, I'm gonna take us through a couple of pages and just read things out. And then I'm gonna do a round robin around the five respondents, panelists here, and then we'll wrap up. Um, the last slide in this deck, and we'll make this deck available, is actually a, a conglomerate of all of the best advice all on one slide. Um, and I did want to ensure that you had that um, uh, available to you, not only the anecdotals, but also sort of the, the checklist if here's some good ideas to think about. So let me get started here. First and foremost, when we ask for advice and insight from peers, you know, some of the best advice I found in the responses, you know, over plan. Think it through and have a straw man plan and, you know, you're going to forget stuff, but if you over plan it, the odds are good you will have thought of something related to an issue that you hadn't, that hadn't planned for and you can, you can address it. Second of all, get sleep and take care of your health and your family so you can focus on the extra hours you need to work. 
Um, there isn't another CIO for the company for continuity's sake. Um, ensure your IT executive team has cross coverage. I think that's that's obviously a key um, observation. Um, communications and positivity. Um, provide people with the option to work remote if need be for roles that are capable. Um, thankfulness, as I think this might have actually been Eric um, on the Chromebook purchase. I'm glad we moved entirely to cloud-based. Um, but uh, wise choice. Um, do not underestimate the business change impact of people trying to use online platforms, me included, obviously by my Zoom experience today. Um, your CEO and most of your leadership have not given BCP a second thought. You and the CFO and possibly legal risk or HR are the core first responders. Um, ensure that all of your team, your core team of first responders and leadership are aligned in advising the CEO. You know, there, there may be different points of view and ensuring alignment is, is crucial. And then I thought this one, another one was a good observation. Vendors are more freaked out than you probably are. Um, realize that they depend on economic stability to service and sell you more things. Now that you're pressing on the SLA button, they're usually pretty thin in that area. Um, and we're all beginning to see exactly how thin they are. Empathize and also balance that with expectation. Um, and the things that we had, you know, you'd wish you thought you'd thought about before now, or you had done something about um, one, how do you get users to follow support ticket procedures? Um, still so many text calls, direct emails rather than tickets. Um, this is really BCP um, and a lot of smaller companies tend to push it off. Never waste a crisis. Um, this is certainly qualifies as that. Uh, make sure you can talk to why certain things are not in place or why they need to be prioritized going forward soon. Um, improve communications within the organization and in each office to ensure people do not need to congregate. I think that's an interesting one that I, I pulled out was, you know, I hadn't really thought a lot about people congregating in conference rooms. Um, as my wife and I go to the grocery store and we keep six feet from everybody else. Um, but conference rooms still are rampant with elbow to elbow meetings. Um, ensure everyone in IT knows how to use the collaboration and remote meeting platforms because everybody's going to be pressed into support and service on those. Um, pay attention to things that come up your in, in your inbox, which you might have ignored as noise in the past, specifically impact to business service or operations. Um, that's going to be felt most acutely. Two words, recession planning. Um, and then lastly, play the long game. Uh, realize this is going to be longer than you think and hurt more people than you want. Realize your frame of mind and leadership style will set the tone every day for your IT team and who you serve. Be their steady rock. Um, to me, these are, these are the advices that, you know, we wish we had every day. There's so much in the role of a CIO and an IT leader, I have found where you're, you're pretty much you yourself and maybe the CFO or the CEO, but you're making some very tough decisions that are impactful to hundreds, if not thousands of people. And as this, as this outlines, you know, you're needed more than ever. And you've got to be thinking about this as a long game. This isn't just the problem of the day or the problem of the hour. Um, and it's, it is the message and the mindset that you bring to the game that's going to make a difference. Um, there is this slide, and it's a lot of words on a slide. So I'm going to put it out there and say, hey, this is at the end of the deck. Um, it is available. It is sort of four categories and fundamental recommendations. Um, there's some good advice here. But let me come back and just go around Robin real quickly. Scott, let me start with you. Um, do you have any pearls of wisdom or sage advice you'd like to share with others right now? I think this group uh, has done a fantastic job and, and what you've got on the slide is, is fantastic. The only thing that jumps to mind there is, it's, it, it, I agree, it's often difficult to get money for DR and for uh, BCP. However, if you, if you take that into consideration and in every single other decision you make with your applications, with your infrastructure, with your partners, and you make, and, and you always have that as, as a key item where you're moving your BCP or your DR program forward in every purchase you make, in every architectural decision you make, in everything you do with your business, you can get a long way without having to go for dedicated BCP and DR dollars. And for me, that has been a very valuable way for me to get as far as we've gotten over the last several years without dedicating specific dollars in that bucket. 
that's the only additional pearl. There's so much good, so many great ideas out here. Thank you, sir. Mark, how about yourself? Well, um, I guess uh, similar to what Scott said, um, I thought I had some good ideas until you read this whole slide. And then it really jumps out me, at me with Sim and with you putting together, and I, I appreciate you guys putting this meeting together. Collectively, we have a really great network. And so if someone's trying to figure out something, don't do it in a silo. We have people that are available that have talked here or are on, you know, as participants, you know, reach out to the others and, and you can get help. Someone may have solved this already. And, you know, we, we, I think we have a lot more opportunities to share best practices with each other. Even if some of us are competitors and we share our, you know, the IT things, we're not giving up business secrets. But, you know, um, as we go through this, if, if there's a need, you know, I would reach out to people because someone may have solved it already. Thank you, sir. Padre, how about yourself? The only thing I'd add is something that we have to get used to is remote leadership. How do you manage not just the IT team, but the entire business community when you're not in any building with any of them. And you're essentially stuck with Zoom, for example. Mm -hmm. You're at one end of a camera, they're at the other. And learning to have conversations, not just internal IT conversations, but business conversations remotely. Yeah and scheduling and the logistics of all of that. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Eric, how about yourself? Yeah, two, uh, I guess two things jump out at me. Uh, someone shared this with me about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And if people are scared about their food, shelter, health, those are gonna trump their concerns about, you know, doing this IT ticket or finishing this project within scope. So for, for us as IT leaders to have empathy for our staff and our employees, uh, it's all uncharted territory. Everybody's dealing with this, um, you know, one day at a time. So just try and be that go-to, you know, empathetic leader, someone that's going to make sure that people have their back and that they'll get through this, you know, this too shall pass. Hopefully we'll get back to normal sooner rather than later. Um, my only other tidbit I'd, I'd be remiss without saying is, I mean, a lot of our IT groups are feeling the stress of, of too few people or a lot of influx and in support and we can't deploy equipment, that, that type of basic things and lean on other organizations if you need, uh, in particular mine can help with trying to hire in staff if you need that short, short term help. So we're all in this together. Thank you, sir. Rick, I'll let you finish this up here, sir. Well, thanks, Rob, and thanks again for putting this this together. It's just an amazing job that you're able to pull off in such a short period of time. Um, you know, one of the things I wish we had done more of as an IT group was use, use these tools and really practice working with Microsoft Teams or whatever the collaboration teams and actually practice using this in a remote area. And as the leader of the IT group, I should have, uh, you know, I wish I would have forced it a lot more so that uh, you know we could actually have experienced this in a more uh, uh, in a deeper way as we're trying to transition the whole organization to remote working, uh, but not having you know really used the tools as much as we should have internally, so that we could help people with that transition. I wish we I wish I would have prioritized that and uh, and made my teams use it a lot more, uh, so that we could really uh, really help people a lot. Uh, just to uh, transition a lot better than we did. I would I'd add on to what Eric said, you know, as I'm sitting here in the in my um, basement trying to find one room in the house where I can I can do this meeting from. You know, my wife and I both work full time. Now we've our schools are closed down. We've got three kids in grade school now that we're homeschooling for the very first time. I have a new appreciation for educators, by the way, uh, and trying to keep our our household to have some sort of normal normalcy, you know, kids still doing their, their assignments at home and, and reading and, and, and math. And then my wife and I trying to do meetings uh, and teach them during the day. There's a, our people have, are going through some incredible stress right now, trying to deal with all that. And it's, it, it's, I really like how Eric said that. And we got to be mindful of that as we, as we, uh, as we go forward over the next you know, several weeks or months. 
Thank you.